Well, hi, everybody. I'm Raj Kumar, President and Editor-in-Chief of DevX, and back to you again with one of our coffee house conversations. I'm actually sipping Colombian coffee in Colombia today uh, with an incredible group that you're seeing here before me. Uh, this is an, uh, an opportunity to talk about angel investing and the sustainable development goals, really angel investing with an impact purpose. And we've assembled with our partners at the Milken Institute, just an incredible group of experts, people who come from the entrepreneurial side of this, the investor side of this, the kind of infrastructure side of it, to talk about where we are with angel investing um, in these markets, what the opportunities are, what you do if you're an investor watching this, what you do if you're an entrepreneur watching this. Um, I'm looking forward to a really rich conversation. I want to welcome Glenn Yago, who is our partner here at the Milken Institute, normally based between uh, Jerusalem and Berkeley, I think, if I have that right, or Santa Monica, uh, Glenn. Thanks for, for being a part of this today. And I, maybe I'll just turn the floor to you for a second to, to give your quick take on what we're here to talk about. Sure. I, I think the, the main point that we need to dive into is that your recognition you can have a vibrant economy or a global, uh, a vibrant and dynamic global economy or a return to some kind of new normal uh, and capital markets that provide savings for opportunities for households, unless you have a vibrant system of rapidly growing firms and business formation and job creation. And angel investing plays a big role in that because if you look at advanced economies, you look at the biggest businesses in the world today. I mean, I'm talking about the top you know, trillion dollar market cap business. Many of them started with angel investors taking that initial risk, seed funding them, um, becoming that engine of both you know, economic growth and, and employment, but also addressing important social issues and environmental issues. So maybe Silvana, can I turn to you for a second, just get us going? Because you're an entrepreneur here as part of this, this conversation. You run Pravana Health in Bangladesh, you founded it, you created it, you've raised funds to build one of the fastest growing health services companies in the country. Um, get, tell me a little about your experience raising funds and, and the broader points we're here to talk about today. Sure, thank you so much for having me. It's a real real honor to be here with this esteemed group and, and to see you again, um, Raj. I think the short answer is it's been extremely challenging um, raising money for a venture in Bangladesh. Um, Bangladesh is, um, not yet considered a sexy investment destination, but um, as someone who worked both in development and in the private sector, it was very important to me that I wanted to build a for-profit enterprise that could live on its own, um, given that Bangladesh has reached this stage of its development where it's actually a middle-income country now, and there are really promising business opportunities um, throughout the country. Um, but unfortunately, there are a lot of inefficiencies in the market for capital across emerging and frontier markets. And um, there just, you know, there just isn't a list of a dozen VCs or even five really that would fund my business. And so I had to get creative and I've actually raised uh, nearly $11 million primarily from angels. Um, and so, you know, we've been supported by an incredible group of people who are really excited both about the financial opportunity, but also the impact opportunity that a healthcare company in Bangladesh offers. Uh, so, Vanna, you're a little bit like me. Like, I, I'm, I'm American, but I spent time in India as a kid, and you're American, but spent time in Bangladesh as a kid. Did you end up raising your funds from exclusively American investors, or, or were you able to raise funds in Bangladesh? Um, I raised very little funds in Bangladesh, actually. Most of the funds I raised were from Americans. Um, our lead investor is half Bangladeshi, half American, so we did tap into the diaspora. Um, uh, we also have investors based out of Dubai and Singapore, so really all over um, have really collected a really incredible group. And I think the other thing is when you are raising primarily from angels, one of the things that we found that's been really impactful because we don't have the resources that a VC offers um, in terms of strategic insight is we've brought in angels who are actually healthcare entrepreneurs um, in you know, countries all over the world and have built, built successful businesses that relate to, the, to our business model so that we can really learn from them and lean on them. Um, throughout our journey. This is a big thing that maybe is not always understood. That angel investors don't just provide capital, but very often are themselves successful entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and they're providing this advice to other businesses. Um, we actually have somebody here, Chris Schroeder. I, I think of you as kind of a super angel for the low and middle income world, for the emerging, emerging world. You do a lot of investing, investing, advising um, in many markets, Middle East, Africa, Latin America, uh, maybe Chris. Oh, we Southeast Asia, maybe you could just jump in with where you see this market now. I know you spend a lot of time with entrepreneurs like Silvana. I think uh, Silvana hit on something that's important that is also an element of just timing, because what happens is I think success breeds success. And I mean it not just in terms from a capitalist perspective, that the more successful enterprises are, the more money that wants to come in, but that there's also this flywheel that gets developed, particularly at the angel stage. And in you know, Silicon Valley, 
we used to call it the PayPal effect, which is that when a company like PayPal gets very successful, it spins out literally not only hundreds of other entrepreneurs, but enough wealth that those entrepreneurs are funding other entrepreneurs. And that cycle that I've seen now, there's the Kareem effect in the Middle East, there's the Grab effect, Southeast Asia, there's a Mercado Libre effect in Latin America, and it's really exciting, and it is, it's a staging. And Savannah hasn't had the benefit yet of, of that kind of flywheel getting in motion, but it's gotten in motion now in a, in a way that even in my most hopeful setting five years ago, I'm not sure I would have seen it as, as dramatic as it is right now, because there's just there's a lot of money out there. And I think one of the things, one of the groups that I help is a group called Village Global. And they're a Silicon Valley venture capital fund, but they're global. And their thesis is that great entrepreneurs know the best other entrepreneurs. And the more entrepreneurs that are being spun out, the more people know how it's done, to your point. Not only is there capital, but there is this expertise from the early stage to the scale up. And it has moved quite rapidly. So Chris, you're starting to see in markets um, domestic angel investor networks being built. People who succeeded in their startups like a grab and they're investing in the next round. And that's something you're beginning to see happen? Significantly so. And it, it actually also has another flywheel element of it because as an American investor, if I see that Mudasser from Kareem is investing in a company in, La in the Middle East, I think to myself, well, that's a buy signal. Like that's an additional piece of insight that's very valuable. Yeah, and I, I want to come back a little bit later to sort of how you find that out, because I want to talk about sort of the investor standpoint and what the platforms are to, to learn. But Frank, maybe I can bring you into this because you're a Kenyan, but you live in South Africa. You run the African Venture Philanthropy Alliance. So you're seeing this from many perspectives on the continent of Africa. Where do you see the market today from your standpoint? So um, we, we, we are an investor-only network. So we, we work with investors providing grants debt and equity into the impact space. Um, and we've, uh, we've actually just finished a study, uh, a social investment landscape mapping study across 18 countries in Africa and published it uh, November 2020, last year. And, and one of the things about angel investing in Africa is still fairly nascent, um, still very young, but it's buzzing, it's growing. Uh, we have about 82 networks of angel investors in, in Africa at the moment. Uh, and and uh, you know, in, out of the 54 countries, I'd argue maybe 80% of them have an angel network or, or something close. Um, so that's coming along nicely. But some of them are still in very much in their formative stage, so they haven't made that many investments. And the reality is also that uh, in Africa, the kind of investments that angel investors can make are fairly small. The, the ticket sizes are, are relatively small. Can you give uh, but, like, what's, a, what's a ticket size that you would see in Africa? And then maybe somebody, Chris, you can tell us a sense of an American ticket size you might be used to. Yeah, so, so, so like now, uh, actually, I was having a conversation with someone literally uh, on Friday. In, in the post-COVID stage, like some networks are seeing 30, 40, 50, 50 grand, um, you know, in terms of this, this kind of dollars. sizes. Yeah, it's dollars. Um, so, so, so there is, there is uh, the desire and willingness. And the good thing is that these things, these networks are just uh, uh, forming uh, pretty organically. Like you look at the Dazzle Angels in, in South Africa, there's a group of women came together and they said they're going to, fund women-led businesses uh, and and these are corporate uh, employees who are putting in their bonuses and salaries into a pooled fund uh, and they're doing this so it's it's still way way uh, early in my view and and the other thing i also notice that if you look at a country like kenya most of the money that comes into the angel investing space is international so we still don't have enough local african people funding angel investment uh, uh, so that's something i think that we still need to work on so it's things like maybe a diaspora network or sort of like what Silvana tapped into for, for her business. Chris, what's a, what's a ticket size you would expect to see in Europe or in the U.S. in a more advanced economy? I mean, we're, we're in this sort of crazy period right now, which uh, uh, Angel's round will look like what an A round used to look like. I mean, literally could be millions of dollars in some cases. I think in a lot of the rising markets, I mean, it's still usually somewhere between half a million and maybe two million on the larger side of it. Frank, I'm just curious. I mean, is there a flutter wave effect? I mean, Africa is a, a continent of over 50 countries. Are there yeah. some countries that are anchoring this, you know, you know moving yeah. more quickly? And is there like a flutter wave mafia yet? Or Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, for sure. South Africa, for example, is way ahead. And they find the ticket size in South Africa are bigger. So there'll be $100,000 and above in South Africa generally. But you go to the other smaller countries, the smaller ticket sizes. So I think Nigeria, for sure, there's a there's actually a lot of wealthy people in Nigeria too. Uh, and the good thing of the Nigerian capital is moving east. It's moving towards East Africa too. Yeah, so, so I, I think you find that there's certain epicenters of activity uh, and then the rest follow. 
Let, let's stay on the continent of Africa if we can. Elizabeth, maybe let's bring you into the discussion because you run the Africa crowdfunding platform and you're thinking about crowdfunding as a way to get some of these socially minded impact startups off the ground. Um, tell us about how you see the market from your perspective. Oh, so thanks very much, Raj, for having me. I think that the point made earlier about this, this order of magnitude in that the angel investing um, happens at a small scale, that's actually a really important part of uh, being an angel investor. It's an ability to make small size investments because when it comes to the SDGs, actually um, a lot of the finance that is needed is small scale finance. So small investment sizes for SMEs that are creating jobs, you know, SDG 8, SDG 9 small scale finance for smallholder uh, farmers that are creating food security. So I think that's SDG two and that's small scale point. finance for creating renewable energy. And when you get a whole bunch of small investors involved in a deal, it's, I, it's useful to have a platform that intermediates um, that capital, right? So there are a lot of platforms um, abroad. So I mean, outside of the African continent that are benefiting from regulations in those countries to actually aggregate those small investors and uh, reduce the burden on an individual angel investor um, in, in terms of the legal burden, regulatory burden, actually act finding the access to opportunities. So if you look at sort of the Netherlands, Sweden, Germany, you've got um, in the renewable energy space, Lend a Hand, uh, Trine, Ecoligo, that are sort of pooling funds for social for um, solar projects in, uh, in Africa. You've got on the equity investment side, uh, Afriquity in France pooling funds for Francophone, uh, West Africa, North Africa. There's Guangxi, that's another one doing equity investments from France into Francophone Africa, so a big diaspora play. In the US, you've got Untapped Global, which um, is a platform that is aggregating investments from sort of wealthy investments in the US. You've got a Kazi Capital base in, in Canada, quite a recent initiative that's also focusing on Africans in the Canadian diaspora mobilizing their funds into Canadian um, special purpose vehicles on behalf of, of the African beneficiaries. But there's, so those are platforms that are based abroad, but there's also a, a really significant growth in African crowdfunding platforms and um, sort of the likes of Autis Africa Capital in Uganda, um, offering access sort of to the angel investor networks that Frank mentioned, the 82 of them are actually African business angel networks these platforms are helping them um, crowd their, their capital into vehicles on behalf of African projects. There's also Funkis um, in Mauritius that's offering sort of debt-based uh, products for SMEs. And sort of on the debt-based side, the returns are around 12% on average per year. Whereas in the overseas platforms outside of Africa, the returns are more on the order of sort of um, five to 6%, sometimes 7%. And yeah, you've got you've got Wenzi, Wengi uh, equity crowdfunding platform in Tanzania. You've got Possession doing peer to peer lending in Kenya. You've got Found Crowdy in Nigeria that's pulling in uh, funds on behalf of uh, smallholder farmers. Uh, you've got Thunder Fund Africa that's doing rewards based and revenue based finance in Kenya. So that's really really a large um, area of growth, which is going to help those smaller angels get into those deals. And if you're following along um, on any of the platforms, we'll put it in the notes, the, the list of these, these uh, funding sites. And in fact, Elizabeth, on your organization's website, you've got a directory of African crowdfunding uh, platforms. And I counted something like 30 or so that are a total there. Um, I just want to underline something you said right at the outset. And we're getting a little feedback, so maybe mute if you're not talking right now. Um, something you said at the outset, which is why angel investors are so important. As Silvana mentioned, like, there are very few VCs that would go and fund a business opportunity like hers. And I guess if you talk to a VC, their mindset is we need you know, to go big. Like we, need, we, we have a large amount of money to deploy. We need to write larger checks to bigger potential businesses that can go public quickly, that can reach you know, major multi-billion dollar market caps. And the angels don't necessarily need that, right? I mean, I guess angels can go in and write that smaller check. They don't have as much transaction costs and maybe they can even take a little more risk. Is that how you're seeing the, the, the opportunity here, why angels are so important, if you think of it from an impact perspective? Yeah, absolutely. A thousand dollars goes really far in terms of impact um, and, you know, and, and being an appropriate size of capital for a lot of African SMEs. $50,000, $100,000 is an appropriate amount of capital, growth capital for an African SME at the early stage. So, you know, as, as Silvana mentioned, it's very, very hard for traditional financiers, even VCs, to get into that deal size. 
And you know, beyond the issue of the order of magnitude, um, there's issues of what type of finance is going in. So it's it's not always equity. You know, we're not sitting with a, a park of unicorns to to feed here. We, we've got you know zebras as they call them. A lot of um, SMEs that are going to have a different growth profile, but are nonetheless providing sustainable jobs, which is very important to reach the the SDGs. Ali, let's get you into this discussion. Tell us about Village Capital, where, where it fits into what we're talking about today. Yeah, th well, this is exactly a point I wanted to jump in on. Um, first, to say that, uh, to just double down on the point that angel investors provide not only um, more um, risk capital, but potentially patient capital that's required um, oftentimes in these more nascent markets and in, um, and in impact-oriented sectors where it may take a little more time to get to that growth uh, profile that maybe a VC would be looking for. Um, so um, Village Capital, not to be confused with Village Global, which Chris mentioned earlier, which uh, who we admire uh, at very much. Um, we have um, been um, both running um, entrepreneur support programs, um, as well as investing in very early stage impact driven ventures for about the last decade. And um, we've been operating in not only in the US, but in um, markets that were um, 10 years ago, pretty nascent in Sub-Saharan Africa, in um, in Latin America, as well as in South Asia, primarily India and South Asia. Um, and we've definitely seen um, that flywheel effect grow, uh, as Chris mentioned earlier, over the last decade. Um, but certainly there are still a lot of places um, where that, that doesn't exist. And even to Frank's point in Kenya, um, where there have been um, successful entrepreneurial stories, um, there is still a bit of a challenge um, in um, getting that flywheel of angel investors who are successful entrepreneurs going at the way that I think we would have expected. Um, so certainly there's a lot of challenges, but I think where the interesting opportunity for angel investors and the work that we do um, to connect is really the growth of the entrepreneur support ecosystem at a local level in a lot of the markets where we operate. So um, we had previously thought of sort of the big global heavyweights like Techstars or 500 startups as sort of the um, the, the, the game in town um, in terms of acceleration opportunities, entrepreneur support opportunities, and those are still incredible ways for impact-driven or not impact-driven entrepreneurs to get support. But we're seeing um, a massive growth in locally driven accelerators, incubators, co-working spaces with programming. Um, and there's a huge opportunity to connect angels with those groups um, in order to provide the support that entrepreneurs need, both from a capital perspective, but also from an expertise perspective. So in addition to the online platforms that exist, I think you know, when we get back to, to being able to do more in person, there's, there's a huge offline opportunity as well at a very local level. Yeah, and until we get to the Flutterwave Mafia, you know, the PayPal Mafia equivalent or the Grab Mafia happening everywhere, what we might need is more of what Sylvana experienced, you know, the, the American or European investor, maybe diaspora or otherwise, and they need some sense of confidence, like, okay, well, this is a, an institution I can go work with that has vetted these deals and I can invest alongside credible investors. Um, Glenn, I, I wonder, because you sit at the intersection of the global development community that I live so much in and, and this world of finance, whether you think the traditional global development sector gets this idea of the flywheel, you. You, you and, and Frank on that, like, are, are you hearing people think about uh, development aid and development funding for these kinds of institutions that Ali talked about, accelerators, incubators, are you seeing it happen? That's the primary channel, I think, at this point to accelerate is exactly that. I mean, you know, 75 years ago, it was 15 governments in the world that represented 50, over 60% of GD, global GDP. Now global GDP is, is much wider and 60% of the GDP is coming from developing economies. So where it's always been a good idea to have an inclusive econ global economy, now there's really no choice if you wanna see a sustainable long-term recovery. The, the point about the, uh, about the importance uh, of strong returns for investors is really key. And the channel of flow is through private or public-private uh, capital flows. You've got about two thirds of employment and half of the GDP in high-income countries coming from these smaller firms. 
that of course become middle and larger firms. But in the developing world, it's much less than that. It's a fraction of that. Uh, and in Africa, it's, it's around 10 to 15% of, of, of GDP. So this process has to be accelerated. And I think what Elizabeth was talking about is really encouraging because to have the ability to, uh, to cross list uh, companies and tap into the angel networks uh, through those platforms is very key. I know we have our, our crowd in Israel primarily that doesn't invest in Israel, but the most of the investments are outside of Israel from that. And then also having the ability to invest on a side-by-side -side basis with, uh, with larger angels and venture capitals on similar terms. So that's a very attractive proposition to crowd in those private investors. So we're missing a huge, uh, a missing potential. And you just imagine the possibilities of this. There's conservatively, you know, around $4 trillion of GDP from to the developing uh, SME sector, country SME sectors. That's potentially millions of jobs. Every dollar that's invested in an SME in the developing economies generate about $12 for the overall economy. So the returns on, the cate on, on, on that category of, of small businesses is, is enormous. There's this missing middle in developing countries that have to be mainstreamed. And the returns there are uh, sometimes, and by some estimates, in excess of 5% a month. So the so in terms of the potential growth potential there. So to be able to accelerate that through finance and through technology is the key challenge right now if we're to get back to a, a long-term period of, of stable and sustainable global growth. Yeah, Frank, based on what Glenn is saying, your phone should be ringing off the hook, right? Are the, are the development agencies calling you and saying, how do we get more development aid into building angel investing networks, into supporting entrepreneurs? I mean, do you see that connection happening the, to the extent that it should? Raj, I can see Ali smiling. If you have any network, any contacts in this aid agency, please give them my number because they're not. Uh, if, if, if anything, um, aid to Africa is reducing. Um, Southern Africa, for example, has lost 20% of aid in the last five years. And this is at a point when Africa actually needs more money. We need between half a billion to $1.2 trillion annually to meet our SDG goals. And we've been highly dependent on government funding and aid for that. And aid is reducing. Uh, in the Trump era, USAID funding to Africa came down. So we don't have that much grant capital uh, in Africa to help with some of the early stage de-risking uh, and cushioning of private capital, but we need private capital to come into, into this space. Uh, and and we're, we're, we're at a point in time where we need to be very deliberate about engaging private capital players. But that means that we've got to be fairly competent as, a, as an ecosystem of social investors on things like innovative finance. People in foundations must be able to understand that uh, they can be catalytic investors and not give all their money out as grants. They can co-invest alongside other mainstream players. Uh, but there's a lot of unconscious incompetence at the moment. There are people, a lot of us uh, in the social space don't know what we don't know. So, so there's huge need for us to do a lot of innovative finance training um, where we can bring, especially grant makers for me, up to speed with things like blended finance, impact investing, venture philanthropy, bringing non-financial capital providers into this space because it's not always about money. Uh, sometimes it's just that people need uh, you know, non-financial support. Uh, so there's never been a more significant time in Africa. If we've got to transform the continent, we need to see how we leverage private capital and be very smart about how we use grant capital, whether it's coming from aid agencies or, uh, or, uh, or, or, or private foundations. So one of the things I'm, I'm actually trying to fight with, with, uh, with development agencies say, okay, guys, you've funded us for the last 50 years on the continent. You're existing now at least leave us more capable to maintain and sustain what you've invested in the last 50 years. Empower the African social investor to be able to carry forward what you've put down. Okay, and, and that's, that's not happening. So, so, so we're looking, I mean, let me, let me show you another thing. If you want to do an innovative financing program in Africa using an African institution, in 54 countries, you have one choice. There's only one institution in Africa that has an innovative financing program. Others, your choice is to go to Who Oxford, Cambridge, University of Cape Town. Okay, others you have to go to Oxford, Cambridge, and they'll charge you a couple of hundred thousand pounds to come and train 20 people, go back and come back six months later. We don't have that luxury of time. So, so some of the program I'm really passionate to build is institutional capacity on innovative finance so we can train more African social investors in this new paradigm where we blend private capital and grant capital. Um, uh, we're doing a lot of work with our Asian sister network, AVPN, to, to, to bring together social investors into, into programs that bring Asians and Africans because of the similar economies. I think there's a lot of learning that could happen there. So we're setting up almost um, MBA, international MBA type 
programs um, to, to do like 50, 60 to 100 social investors at any point in time. So there's that kind of stuff that we're doing consistently, but they, this is a really pivotal time for us. Yeah, interestingly yeah, enough, and hopefully everyone is safe, but Elizabeth was sharing before we started, the University of Cape Town actually has a fire right now on their campus that's burning part of their campus. Um, I, I do want to welcome everyone who's following this along to feel free to throw in questions if you want on whatever platform you're on, and we'll, we'll try to weave them into the discussion if we can. Silvana, I think you might have wanted to jump in. Yeah, no, thank you. I just wanted to follow on to your, um, your comments and, and Frank's as well on, on development finance institutions. Um, I do think that they, they, you know, they, they, they play such an important role in, in, in these economies, but they're still a bit inflexible. And I think there's a big gap in between where angels are stepping in and where venture capitalists are stepping in and where the DFIs are stepping in. I'll, I'll just share, my company is a healthcare company that's been on the front lines of my country's COVID response. We were the first private lab to get approval to do COVID testing. We are the healthcare provider for the Asian Development Bank and the International Finance uh, Corporation and seven UN agencies and the entire World Bank group. None of them has given us any funding. And, um, and this is in a pandemic when all anyone's talking about is how we need, you know, we need more investments in healthcare infrastructure in every country in the world. Um, and yet our deal size is still too small for the IFC to come in. You know, we have a great relationship with them. I know them really well. I know people in the help team. I know people, I know the head of the Bangladesh office. Um, and uh, the organizations are still a bit inflexible, I think, to, you know, to try to do what we're, we're now in the market for, for a $12 million raise for a Series B for expansion. Um, but even the DFIs aren't ready for, you know, for, for a deal that size in a market like Bangladesh. Yeah, well, they might need to fund, you know, the, the next layer down of funds that can then get, yeah. you know, get funding there, but it sounds like that's not even happening, at least to the extent those of you- It's not, it's not. I know Bamboo Capital. I know, I know like two funds that we would be the perfect deal for. They have been in the market raising for the last five years. And again, even against the, you know, backdrop of this global pandemic, where we've seen the need for more investments in infrastructure. This is what I meant at the beginning when I said, I do think there are so many inefficiencies, but there's got to be a gap somewhere. And I think, you know, Frank is doing wonderful work, um, you know, in, in trying to fill that in, but we, we need more initiatives. Yeah, what's remarkable to me, Silvana, is you come from the global development sector. You know it very well. You <laughs> set out to start a startup that has impact in Bangladesh. And yet, if you couldn't navigate the development finance institution, exactly. Once they exactly. Fund, how would a startup entrepreneur who doesn't know this world figure it out? Ali, I think you wanted to jump in as well. Yeah, I was just going to jump in. I, I, I think that's absolutely right that the DFIs are struggling with how to get to that very early stage um, and fill that gap. I think there is an interest in figuring out how to support emerging fund managers and smaller size funds. And we've seen a few initiatives that are starting up um, within um, some of the DFIs, including the, the DFC is trying to figure this out. But the problem is we don't have the time that they're taking to figure it out. And so um, I, I, I will say I've been encouraged by the conversation and the direction that it's heading, but we need others are going to have to step in while they're taking the time to figure it out. I mean, with diligence timeline still like 18 to 24 months, um, that's, that's not exactly a rapid response. But um, we're also seeing organizations like INP in France who are supporting, again, sort of smaller funds and trying to figure out the technical assistance piece for emerging fund managers. So there's some interesting things that are that are coming about, but not nearly at the scale that we need right now. I, I wanna make sure I open it up to whoever wants to jump in. I just wanna put out there, I'd like to get to a question around sectors in a while, if we get the chance to get there, but go ahead. I think Elizabeth and Glenn both wanna jump in. Elizabeth, why don't we start with you? Thanks, Raj. Um, just to Ali's point um, on the lack of support to intermediaries, that are small fund managers in the African market, and I'm sure it's the same in other emerging markets. This is a massive issue. So development finance uh, agencies and institutions struggle um, regardless of, of the intermediary to get into this underserved segment of the market, which can be broadly defined as SMEs needing between $50,000 and $500,000. And um, when they sort of come to that segment, there's a lot of confusion within the DFIs over what their role is to be played. Is it, um, are they concessional uh, capital providers or are they commercial capital providers? It makes it very hard for intermediaries to um, understand who they should approach and how the blended finance initiatives should actually take place. And um, then of course you get the, 
this issue that you know the intermediaries themselves are confronted with the demand so that's the, the actual SMEs and they know that the traditional fund model is not well suited to meet the demands of these SMEs and so they um, want to innovate on the fund model itself but because a lot of them are emerging fund managers they've really sort of got a host of barriers vis-a-vis -vis LPs actually raising capital so they tend not to uh, present non-traditional fund models um, just to sort of tick more LP boxes. And this is sort of a chronic problem. And I think the DFIs that are making the most progress in, in tackling it are the ones who are viewing this issue with actually a, a gender lens, because they're finding that in order to reach some of their gender goals, I'm sure you've heard of the 2X challenge, it's a big G7 DFI um, initiative, they actually have to innovate on the way that they enter that segment of the market, because the chronic shortage of capital to that segment creates um, um, basically very little representation of women-led SMEs in the um, downstream and the higher deal tickets. And that's a problem for them because they can't actually reach the, reach the gender goals. So people like Savannah are exactly in that market segment. And there, there are so many ways that the DFIs um, can support the intermediaries in that segment. Ali mentioned emerging uh, fund managers. A lot of them are female. Um, and you know, we sort of talk for days on, on what measures those are. But in terms of, as Eddie mentioned, um, you know, just getting there faster, there are a number of quick wins on the table right now for, for DFIs in my view. And one of them is creating the enabling environment in Africa for these angel networks and for these, these crowd investing platforms. African regulators do not have the same resources as the US, Canada or Europe. Um, putting in place a, a, a proper um, appropriate regulatory framework to, to facilitate these, these private sector investments is actually quite a big job and it does require grant funding, but not that much. So um, it needs to be viewed as a strategic um, enabler of, of the intermediaries in that underserved segment. And you know, if you see in the US now, you've got small funds, a lot of them are diverse fund managers, people of color and women, that are using crowd investing regulations actually raise a fund. And that's great for the, for, the, for the fund manager because it's a quicker path to market than, as Ali mentioned, spending years trying to convince an, an LP. Um, but it's also great for angel investors because they get to invest alongside a qualified fund manager. So yeah, I'll stop there. I think there's a huge opportunity for DFIs here. Um, you just have to think a little bit more strategically and innovatively around the segment. And just quickly for those following along who don't know, an LP is a limited partner. So in a fund, you might have a general partner, the person starting that fund, and they need these limited partners to invest in it. And those limited partners might um, have a risk perception. They might say, well, if it's a new fund manager and they're funding SMEs, small and medium enterprises, I'm not interested. It's too risky for me. Or it's a women-led enterprise. I'm not interested in that. I'm not part of that club, right? So a lot of this is about risk perception. And that's where women and other marginalized groups get left out of the financial sector even in very advanced economies, right? This is, a, this is not just a developing country question. I think Glenn wanted to jump in. Just um, uh, very quickly, I just want to emphasize Elizabeth's point about the enabling environment and the capacity building that's critical for this process. Because DFIs, let's put it in perspective, they're a fraction, even if you took all the overseas development assistance in the world, it's a fraction of what's needed in order to jumpstart and reach the flight a uh, 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 circle cycle stage that, that Chris was talking about. You know, you've got to, you've got to, the importance of that is to be able to have the connectivity here and that the DFIs can do. First, they, they haven't been writing equity checks for a very long time. I mean, uh, you know, CDC, now the, U, now the new U.S. Development Finance Corporation has that capability, uh, but it's a relatively new thing for them. What they can do is they can absorb the pre-development cost and they can deal with the risk mitigation uh, that Elizabeth was pointing out. That seems that's a very critical function. And the other one is to help the, develop the pipeline. I mean, aside from our, our field fellows that we have working out of our center um, that are in Africa uh, from Jerusalem, uh, the Milken Institute has its capital markets program with the IFC training people uh, in those in, in the finance in the finance ministries in the central banks to understand this process of linking to the capital markets because that's where the money is that needs to be invested, but to do the pipeline development. And then that's something the EFIs can, in the debt side of the market can be very critical in is generating the projects that will, from which the aggregate demand will be derived for these enterprises to grow. 
And in Africa and in India as well, and Latin America, uh, in developing economies in Asia, all of those represent a, an opportunity. It's a $12 trillion opportunity uh, in, the, in the sustainable development goals to reach in terms of doing the same process that occurred uh, under the Fordism of the 20th century and the 21st century to mainstream and build a bridge to middle market, uh, to middle market, middle class and growth economies. Um, that can sustain global development as uh, demographics have changed. I, I got to say, it's pretty gratifying to hear you all talking about how DFIs are at this moment of transformation, because actually tomorrow, I wasn't planning to say this, but tomorrow we're launching our DevEx Invested newsletter, a brand new newsletter at DevEx, all about development finance institutions and the whole ecosystem around them, uh, because we haven't seen enough journalistic coverage of what these institutions are doing and how they need to transform. And I, we happen to believe, as you apparently do as well, that there's a lot of action happening at these DFIs and we need to pay more attention and really push them uh, in these directions. So stay tuned for DevEx Invested and I hope you'll subscribe to it. Um, I think, Frank, you had a question for Chris and maybe Chris, you wanna jump in on, on this point. Yeah, Chris, I was, I, was, I was just checking your experience when you're mobilizing money, especially from the US. Uh, what, what do you see is the appetite for American investors for emerging markets, especially when you think about things like Forex risk um, and those kind of things? You know, how easy is it for Silvana and the likes to, to be able to raise money from, from you as a US investor? Look, I, it's a wonderful question. I think words like mobilize makes it more exciting than it is painfully right now. Um, it's still, I think, very, very frustrating across the map, but it's changing a lot. And I think COVID actually has accelerated this change. I have found some of the most hardened Silicon Valley, I will only miss invest 50 miles from Sand Hill Road types are really deep digging deeply into Latin America and they're showing up in Pakistan. I mean, I'm seeing a curiosity because I think people have learned that talent is everywhere. Talent wants to stay home and needs to be excelled. But the timing of it, I think Sylvana captured pretty well. And so it begs the question, why, you know, what is going on here and why is it so hard? And I think there are three strings to pull on overall. I mean, I still think that a lot of us in the West have a tremendous amount of narrative bias. I can't tell you the number of particularly older, this is generationally better, but some of the older investors I talked to who said, you know, I lost my ass in Brazil 20 years ago. Why would I look at it now? I mean, it's sort of this crazy kind of story and not looking at how things are changing in very, very significant ways. Um, the second, and I've run into this particularly in some DFI stuffs actually in Kenya overall, is that DFIs actually can be very good signalers because they're kind of being where nobody is there. But sometimes they have constraints that they put on the entrepreneurs that then the private investors are confused by. They don't want to do it. I remember looking at one company that began as a Kenya company. The DFI only wanted to focus on Kenya, but the entrepreneur realized that she needed to move to Uganda to really succeed. And that caused friction. Like it wasn't, it was off the mandate. And so that was a thing that has to be navigated, but I think is, is also getting better. But I think the biggest issue overall is that we live in this era of irony because there's more opportunity in the world than ever before. There's talent being unleashed everywhere, um, but that also means your alternatives are greater. And at the end of the day, I can't, I mean, the number of times I've heard LPs and others say to me, I'm making more money in the stock market than I am in my venture capital funds. Why are you convincing me that I need to invest in the Middle East? Like, I don't, I don't get that trade-off. And that's not wrong, right? I mean, that's just something that we need to be on top of. But I think the more sophisticated and I think often new generation uh, investors are saying there is new alpha. Like all the things that we've seen here are happening elsewhere. And now they're examples of the success we talked about earlier. And then it becomes a timing issue. Almost everything Silvana said, I heard all the time in the Arab world 10 years ago. And it's a very, very different conversation even among Americans today, but it's still nowhere near where it needs to be or should be. Well, in the impact lens, you think, Chris, could, could solve this issue because, you know, there are so many investors out there who say, I really want to put my money where my values are. Um, but you look at a lot of the public market ESG type funds and what's in it. It's like, you know, big tech companies and, you know, not much else because there's not, it's, it's sort of some sort of a negative lens. If you really want to invest in healthcare, if you really want to invest in education or in water services, right, if you want to actually invest where there's direct impact, it is going to be in a lot of these markets and maybe the returns aren't as good as people get in the public markets. That's possible. But you think there would be a growing demand for this among especially millennial investors and others. I see some nodding. Uh, Ali, I don't know if you have a, have a view just on this. If I could just do one quick on that, though. I mean, I think yeah. we have to be a little bit careful because obviously the ESG lens is very important. Obviously, there are companies that are going to have amazing impact that will not get return based money per se. But the fact of the matter is almost every entrepreneur I meet everywhere in the world starts their conversation about her impact. 
She's not coming to me telling me how she's going to make money. She's coming to me because there's a problem in her teeth that she wants to solve. And so a lot of the investors therefore look at that and say, well, that may not be a, a checked impact box in a, in a box checking exercise, but from what I value, what I care about, I'm totally in. And so um, that I think is a dynamic that's just real as well. I think we have to emphasize the link between values and value and valuations. You know, there's a, there's a real critical point here in terms of, of what the economic literature is showing us. And we've learned from macroeconomies, especially in this very disruptive moment, where we've realized that systemic risk can't be hedged in a global economy, uh, like COVID, like climate, like uh, all sorts of others, like, like massive global inequality. That the ability to bridge those things is very key to returns. And in fact, that if you look at over time, uh, I mean, the, 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 the research that's coming in on impact is quite dramatic. For 100 years in economics, all we were concerned about was risk and return. And here we are in the 21st century learning that impact actually conditions risk and return. And that's a very critical point. If you're talking about a major structural out reallocation of capital in order to keep global growth alive, we have to have uh, some look at outcomes and the ability to abate externalities that affects the returns on capital. And increasingly more and more institutional investors are recognizing that as well as as, as private equity and, and, and venture investors, how critical that point is. Yeah, absolutely. And especially when you think of the climate crisis, how much that connects. Go ahead, Silvana. No, I was just gonna say, I can't tell you the number of investors I've met in the US, Europe, even Singapore, um, who've said really amazing work you're doing, very inspiring, impressive attraction. Um, you know, I can't invest. I really wish that you had a nonprofit that I could contribute to. And um, <clears throat> I really think that's a big part of the problem is that there's a view that solving these types, solving the problems of healthcare in a country like Bangladesh must be a charitable initiative. And, you know, I think that a lot of this goes back to this Washington consensus view of the world. I don't know if you guys know, but the person who, who founded the Washington consensus died a few days ago. Um, but I think that that view of the world, which which has been very impactful in, in helping us to make progress toward SDGs, but I think is now holding us back, you know, in that there's a view that countries like Bangladesh need to be saved by the West, um, whereas private sector innovation is how I think we're going to save ourselves. And, um, you know, I think that's that's where we really need to go. Private sector development is the only truly sustainable form of development. Yeah, you mentioned earlier that you serve a middle class uh, you know, sector of the population in Bangladesh. And I guess that was considered by some not poor enough for impact, right. is that yes. right? Absolutely, yeah. And that, and that's, I think that's what I mean, that's another example of what I was saying about the inefficiencies in the market for capital is that impact investors are often, they really wanna focus on the bottom of the pyramid, which is great. But what we also know is that when, you know, the citizens of the middle class in any country in the world, including the United States, have access to healthcare and education, you achieve development um, and economic benefits across the economy. And so I think we also need to widen our view of what we think impact is. And China's exhibit A of this, right? The, the massive rise Absolutely. of the middle class in China is an exact case study. I and mean, it's not like Sylvana is making this up. It's like there's hard evidence now today, which I think um, to her point, people just have trouble digesting. Ali, I think you wanted to jump in. Yeah, I, I'm trying to figure out exactly which thread I want to pick up on. But um, one of the so before I, I joined Village Capital, I worked for Steve and Jean Case. Um, and one of the, the um, projects I worked on with them was around field building in the impact investing space, um, sort of 2009, 2011. Um, and one of the things we often talked about was that there is this, this point of view that it's sort of binary that there is either 100% loss through philanthropy or 100% return um, and that there's no middle. And um, I think we've spent a lot of time at either end of those of the spectrum in the impact investing space where we sort of look at either talking about 100% return, 100% return on, on financial return and 100% impact return or 100% impact return and zero financial return. But there's a whole lot of space in the middle um, for opportunities um, that exist. And, and I, th I think that there is also a place for angel investors for tying it back to angel investing in that, in that middle spectrum um, for angel investors who want to generate a return but are comfortable saying, okay, I'm also really a believer in what this represents in terms of the, the problems this company can solve. Um, so I think that's, that's one of the issues. I also want to agree with the sort of focus, um, exclusive focus on the bottom of the pyramid, which is super important, but there's a, there's a lot missing in the conversation if we're not talking about middle income and the sort of like upper low income 
populations as well who can be transformative if we are able to grow the middle class um, there's a huge opportunity for them for us to then sort of lift up the bottom of the pyramid and find other approaches that may not be commercial um, to support the bottom of the pyramid. So Ali, category to be addressed. The spectrum is more important than categorical thinking here uh, because it's not just the bottom of the pyramid or the middle uh, and it's certainly not the top, but, it, but to what would generate growth is what generates returns. And that's the, that's the basic in economics, that's the size of the pie argument. You have to increase the size of the pie and urgently in the developing economies to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to try to avoid the crashes that we've had, uh, both related to health and, and, and pandemic and, and economic issues. What's amazing to me, Glenn, is that uh, there have been some controversial, but there exist investments by DFIs into like five-star hotels in some countries. And if you think of the argument around that, it's, well, we'll invest in this five-star hotel because this is going to drive business. It's going to drive confidence. This is, you know, foreign investors are going to come. Uh, it's going to create employment. Uh, but you'd think if you could justify that, you could certainly justify investments in, in businesses like in the health sector, the education sector that serve a middle-class population. Um, uh, you know, Ali, what would you advise an entrepreneur? Like if there's an entrepreneur coming to you who says, I've got a, you know, an ag tech, an ag business, um, startup and I think it actually has a social impact. It also has real returns. Like, you know, where's the right place to go? Because you talk about these angel investors who might be willing to take less return and take on a little more risk and try to drive more impact. But how do you find them? And are there enough of them? Or would you advise that entrepreneur like, you know, just actually focus on 100% return because that's where you're more likely to raise the, the investment dollars that you need? I really think it depends on the type of business that they're trying to grow and what their growth trajectory is. If they're looking at something that uh, a growth trajectory that appears more like a traditional VC investment, then absolutely they should be pursuing traditional venture uh, venture funds or angel investors who are looking um, to, to generate venture-like returns. Um, certainly, um, I think the consensus of this group is that there is enough money, but maybe not. it's not looking in the right places um, for those types of companies. But um, earlier, Elizabeth mentioned the Zebra movement, um, and I'm also part of the group called Zebras Unite, which is um, really to focus on this, uh, this other class of companies who are not necessarily pursuing the path of a unicorn, but are pursuing a solid growth path and are looking for financing that may look a little bit different than venture because they're gonna take a little bit more time to grow. They're looking for more patient capital. That is a role that, um, that I think angel investors can play. It's a role that I think um, you know, alternative fund structures that are emerging um, can play, whether it's recycled capital, capital or evergreen funds. Um, the Collaborative for Frontier Finance is doing a lot of work on this front um, to build out that infrastructure. So I don't think it exists uh, at anywhere at scale yet, but it's starting to emerge as an, as an idea and a concept that we can build these businesses that generate the types of returns that help grow the economy. But at the same time, not every business is or should be venture backable. Um, it's a small slice of, uh, of what we do um, as, a, as a financing system. Um, and I think it gets the, the bulk of the attention. And I, you know, I'm a big fan of venture, uh, but I think there are other approaches that, that we should be thinking about as well. Anyone want to jump in on that point? Elizabeth, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I just think when we talk about returns in the segment, we've got to be quite cautious um, because one, we don't have a lot of data. Um, as someone mentioned, you know, sort of the INPs, uh, the smaller funds that are targeting this, this underserved market segment, we, we don't have great benchmarks um, for returns in that. I've heard 2% net return sort of in hard currency. I've heard higher. And um, when you look at the funds that are raising capital for their first fund, they'll often put, you know, 20% IRR and um, they'll be presenting a sort of a classic fund structure, closed-ended fund structure. And when you look at the demand, um, what, the sort of type of finance that the SMEs really need, you realize that maybe your returns could be higher if you designed your fund um, to meet their needs rather than the needs of, of the limited partners. So and as Ali mentioned, you know, evergreen structures- Is that most uh, of giving them a longer investment time frame? Is that the main issue? Sorry, what was that, right? The main issue giving them a more, in, a larger investment time frame, giving them more time? 
Uh, whereas limited yeah. partners might say, I want my money back. You know, it's a closed fund. It ends at a certain date. I want to get money back sooner. Exactly. So that, that's, that's a big um, issue. I think that within a closed-ended fund, you can mitigate some of those issues with sort of um, alternative investment instruments, um, in, in instruments that help you generate some capital earlier on in the fund instead of hedging everything on an exit at a specific time. You can just imagine the funds that needed to exit last year during the peak of COVID. Um, you know, it would be much more beneficial for them to hang on a few years. And um, if, if you look at the most experienced intermediaries in the segment, um, funds like Business Partners International, um, they've all argued for open-ended structures. So um, yeah, I, I wouldn't sort of look at the returns um, that you, the data that you can find and sort of conclude that, oh, you know, you don't make a lot of money in the segment, but you do make good impact. I think that we, we need to do a better job of capturing the real opportunity with an appropriate fund structure. Makes sense. Listen, we're down to 10 minutes and I, I want to make sure we're giving some, some practical thoughts to both investors, angel investors who are following along to this, and maybe entrepreneurs who are interested in connecting with those angel investors. Um, so let, let's go around and see who's willing to jump in. But do you have thoughts for both of those groups or what, what you would do now if you were starting a new business as an, and, and looking for angel investment and it had an impact lens, it was in a low and middle income country, or as an angel investor? You know, what can angel investors who are interested in this space be doing differently to surface opportunities, to, to join funds or join networks? What do you see as the, as the next steps for people in this space? Maybe Frank, can I go to you? Yeah, um, so so I'll speak for the context uh, context of Africa. I think this this uh, uh, for anyone. I'm going to put a, a link in the in the in the chat. Uh, please look at the African Biz Business Angel Network, uh, Aban. Uh, they've got a very good resource of of multiple networks across the continent. Uh, if you also come check out the uh, AVPA Deal Share platform, where we bring together investors. Because the question is always, we're always told that there's more investor, there's more capital than the investable opportunities in Africa. We're trying to nullify that through our Deal Share platform uh, to to demonstrate uh, investable opportunities plus bring together uh, co-investing communities. So there's there's, there's plenty happening uh, in this space. Uh, but but also start looking at some smart grant making. Uh, foundations who are willing to come and help you with money for technical assistance, do some of that, the risking initial uh, uh, capital that you need to just kind of get started and set up. Uh, so there's plenty of that can happen. If you need any advice, please reach out to me. I'm happy to help. Yeah, I, I read a World Bank blog that was saying that angel investors in a way are just like DFIs because they give you the funding, but they also provide advice, which is like TA. It's like technical yeah. assistance. Yeah, um, exactly. Who, who else wants to jump in on, on this? Go ahead, Glenn. I was just uh, going to say th this importance of all the cross-cutting ideas that we've laid out here today. You know, one is to uh, also look at, so at, at uh, not at categorical investments, not only at venture uh, or, or angel investing, but being an activist investor to help structure those activities. I think that's a very critical point, type of work that Chris does in the Middle East. Other, other people are involved in things like that in Africa as well, in Rwanda and other places. So it's very important to have activist investors that are helping to actually structure those deals and tie them into technologies. You know, the, the, the alignment between finance and technology is critical here as the key accelerants for growth. And this ability to, um, uh, to, to again, look at the agricultural supply chain, the health supply chain. And that's what certainly has made the returns in the ICT sector so compelling and can do the same of the applications of technology into less technology intensive areas, but are becoming more technologically intense, such as food and agriculture, in wash, you know, uh, uh, waste and, uh, and, and sanitation and hygiene and water. Uh, all of this, these sectors, which are critical for the overall environment of growth, need to be funded and they require both uh, uh, venture and equity investment, but also subordinated debt and other types of characteristics that would generate and cross subsidize the return to private investors. So being an activist investor is, I think, an essential part of it, not just looking for a passive fund to, to invest into, but to take an active role and engagement in these economies. I think that describes you, Chris. Maybe you can pick up from there. You know, you're very active as an angel. Um, what do you look for? What kinds of deals do you invest in? Um, what can others who are looking to do more angel investing in these markets learn from, from your approach? Just to the macro question, I mean, I think the thing that Endevix does this, and I think everyone on this Cole does it, we need to do more of it. Um, I think we can go after the narrative bias clearer because I think 
the, the success that has breeded success now is extraordinary. And even though there may not be, you know, much yet in Silvana's markets, there's enough happening around their markets that if people literally knew they were there and started to focus and understand um, how much this is happening and that we really, in my view, reach a new kind of global economic order that is happening bottom up by entrepreneurs around the world. I think that in and of itself has a lot of value because I just think it's out of the imagination of so many investors overall. Because for me, I, I mean, I don't invest in rising markets any different than I invest in America. Is the entrepreneur unbelievable? Does she have this sort of tenacity and, and integrity that she wants to walk through walls because she has to solve the problem that is on her mind to solve in a very, very powerful way? What is the size of the market? Is the market opportunity real? Does she have an ability to get to the market in ways that she does? Is she willing to listen and sort of be engaged so that even though she has a mission, if new data teaches her that she's got to move somewhere, she's got that kind of flexibility. I and mean, this is all one-on-one stuff. And the fact of the matter is it's actually working now almost everywhere. And I think that people just need to understand that better. They may pick and choose that some place may be less risky than others, and they will certainly choose from a classic investment perspective that I would rather be in America than somewhere else, but that's fine. But for anyone who is globally minded, this actually is the beginning of a golden age. And I think people just need to understand it in a different lens where their narratives tend to typically, I think, weigh on them tremendously to be open to it. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. People who don't have experience in many of these markets just assume, well, government's gonna be hard to deal with. Regulations aren't gonna be up to par. There isn't the rule of law. When in many cases, there's already a vibrant uh, you know, startup. I mean, oh, that's the, I mean, that's the irony. First, I mean, first of all, they're right. But on the other hand, you know, I, I mean, a silly example right now. I think some of the most innovative regulators that I've run into in its early days, and I don't want to pass judgment on it, in fintech are in of all places, Indonesia and Brazil. And people can look at Indonesia and Brazil and talk about all the challenges that are there, which are also true. And so you have to have kind of a couple of parallel thoughts in your brain at the same time, and then you have to navigate risk accordingly. Yeah. All right. Uh, maybe maybe Silvana, I think you want to jump in. Yeah. Um, I, I love that last point. I do think where there's chaos, there's opportunity, you know, and I think that the, the lack of competition, the lack of regulation in these markets um, creates tremendous opportunity. But I'll just, um, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to repeat what some of the wonderful things that have been said. I'll maybe put a slightly different perspective on what, what I think can be done to help build out this ecosystem. And I, I really think there needs to be more work in educating local angel networks um, in how to support entrepreneurship. Um, in Bangladesh, for example, what we see is that um, there is a small but growing angel network, um, but by and large, large, um, you know, uh, industrialists who've done very well financially, they really, they'd much rather just start companies of their own than invest in other entrepreneurs to solve problems. Um, and uh, they're really interested in control. And I think they don't, con, con, by control, I mean ownership, you know, a 51% at least ownership stake. And they, they're, they don't understand what it means to invest in early stage businesses to help to promote um, entrepreneurship. And there are organizations like Endeavor and others that are doing really great work in, in certain markets to help to educate um, local angels on how they can do this work. But I really think there's an opportunity for some of the people here um, to really help to advance that. Um, which I think is needed across a lot of emerging and frontier markets. Absolutely. I think that would be Elizabeth. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So um, for the entrepreneurs that are listening to this chat, um, you'll see in the chat panel a number of links. Um, if you are looking for, for finance, particularly risk finance, and you've got a note from a, a bank, you can actually go to some of their African crowdfunding platforms and see if there's a match for you. Um, and there's also a list of women-led funds um, operating in Africa, which um, a lot of them do have gender lens investment strategies. So if you're a, a women entrepreneur, please go check them out. And beyond that, yeah, to what Savannah just said, um, there's a huge role to be played here by ecosystem organizations, and that includes ours, African Crowdfunding Association, and actually mainstreaming um, angel investing and doing a lot of the educational work. I know that ABAN, African Business Angels Network, also does this. Um, but just bear in mind that you know, if, if you are a crowdfunding intermediary or you're an emerging female fund manager, you are the organization that is bringing that SME to the capital market. You're doing all of the work of investment readiness. And no one pays you for that, right? No startup or SME is gonna uh, sort of pay you to do your due, due, due diligence. And it's, it's an expensive exercise, but it's absolutely critical. And um, you can't escape that just because you're a crowdfunding platform. And there's there's a role here, and I think for, for Grant Capital too, to actually um, put, put in some sort of technical assistance finance to get these SMEs um, to market. 
And what I love about crowdfunding is that it's, it's, it's a first stepping stone into the capital markets. Um, if you are raising equity or, or other investment capital, you, you know, you sort of have a mini prospectus that you need to go through and you start understanding what it means to talk the language um, of an investor, of an angel investor too. And um, that's sort of a path that you've, you've got to go on and it sets you up better for, for private investment later on. And that, um, that work needs to be uh, financed too. Yeah, great point. And that's where I think these, there's a connection with the global development and with the finance world here. I think, Ali, we didn't hear from you yet on this as we close up. Yeah, I, um, I, I've noted this in the chat, but one of the things that we're really focused on is how do we leverage these emerging uh, ecosystem builders in some, particularly in nascent markets. Um, there are a lot of folks who are on the ground interacting with founders, and that's a great way for angel investors to connect with what's happening in local ecosystems. Um, there, are, there are a long list of entrepreneur support organizations and I'm happy to connect with anyone who wants to then um, connect with those groups. Um, I, I included a few examples in the chat, but really looking both at the big global networks as well. Again, I mentioned you know, the, the large um, global accelerators, um, but thinking as well about the local um, organizations on the ground who are working at the very early stages with some of these founders and can help angels uncover opportunities and provide that investment readiness support um, where an angel may not have the capital to, to be able to do that. I just want to mention that uh, we have a number of amazing comments in the chat here from this incredible group of panelists. Not all of you following us can see those depending on what platform you're on, but we're going to gather them and we're going to put, put them in the notes uh, for, for you on whatever platform you're on, because there's lots of great resources that you've, you've heard many of the panelists talk about. We'll get those out there. Uh, tomorrow, DevX Invested launches our free newsletter that covers all of this, uh, led by a team of journalists from around the world, um, including our senior reporter, Adva Saldinger, who's been on the DFI story for many years now. Um, so really excited for all the great ideas you've all shared that we're going to take forward and, uh, and cover at DevX. And I just want to say a huge thank you. Each of you is remarkable in your own right. Having all of you together in this conversation has really been a treat. Um, and I know it's been really valuable to people who followed along. So a big thank you to Elizabeth Howard, Frank Aswani, Silvana Sinha, Ali Burns, Chris Schroeder, and of course, our partners at the Milken Institute, Glenn Yaga. Really great to continue this partnership and continue bringing the worlds of finance and policy and global development together. So thank you so much. This has been fantastic.